Hi, this is Mike Ziegler. I'm General Manager of Churchill Downs, and this is One on One with ABC Partners. It's been just a little over a week since Rich Strike shocked the world by winning the Kentucky Derby as an 80 to 1 long shot. In this episode, we talk with Churchill Downs General Manager Mike Ziegler about that stunning upset and what it means to both the track and horse racing in general. We'll also talk about the impact of legalized sports betting on horse racing and what you just cannot miss when you go to the Derby. But this episode is really all about taking advantage of opportunities when they arise. Whether you're an 80 to 1 long shot horse in the biggest race of them all, or an unemployed California native with absolutely zero background with horses who managed to climb to one of the sport's most high profile roles. Mike also critiques my Kentucky Derby outfit, so of course you'll not want to miss that either. Enjoy. I mean, Mike Ziegler, clearly. We need to start this conversation by talking about uh, the Kentucky Derby, right? Because, uh, well, Rich Strike, probably the most perfectly named horse in the history of horse naming. What was it? 80 to 1 shot? Is that right? That's correct. 80 to 1. Second longest price in Kentucky Derby history. All right. So second biggest long shot in Kentucky Derby history. Can, look, can you talk a little bit about what that was like from your standpoint? Because you obviously, this is not the first horse race you've ever been to. So obviously for... The rest of us, it was like, oh my God, this is, this is unbelievable. Like talk about it a little bit from, from your vantage point as the tracks GM. First of all, I watched the Kentucky Derby with a single focus. And that is, I'm absolutely concerned solely about every horse making it around the circle safely. Okay. So I watch every horse race the exact same way. Um, Please so nobody get hurt. Yeah. As everybody knows, it's, uh, it's, there's been some problems over the last three to five years with horses being injured. Things have gotten significantly better. Um, we've okay. implemented a lot of safety protocols across the country and here at Churchill Downs to ensure the safe trip for the rider and the horse. Right. So that's the first game I'm watching. Right. Watch okay. I watch every single race to just say, all right, everybody made it home. Okay. Let's go. And then I watch, you know, who came across the finish line first. And I was actually, um, pretty close to the racing surface. I saw the 21 come across. And I, I mean, honestly, he it, it's a it's a, an amazing story because, you know, there's 20 horses in the Kentucky Derby. When we take entries for the Kentucky Derby, we take also eligible entries, meaning these are the horses that can draw in if in fact there's a late defection from the field. And at the last minute when we're taking entries, you know, on, mon- on the Monday prior, Horse called Ethereal Road, trained by Wayne Lucas, defected within literally 15 minutes to spare. What, is that, um, what does that mean to defect? I mean, it's like he so went to he went to Russia. No, <laughs> yeah, no, he um, <laughs> he decided not to enter the Derby for whatever reason. I okay. heard, I have not heard why. Um, he was one of the last two draw in initially, so it might okay. have been that he didn't feel like he was ready for the race. He's doing right by the horse for some reason or another. So, so a space right, opens up with minutes to spare seconds let's call it seconds let's, let's, let's call it seconds. it's much more dramatic seconds to spare so this horse draws in off of a third place finish in his last prep race at turfway park that jeff ruby stakes up there so really and, sort of just like a whatever big deal yeah and you know granted he was training well they went you know the week weekend two prior to derby he was training well but most people look at that also eligible drawing as an immediate toss just because he's not even in the original 20. Feet. Right. He's, okay, whatever. So from a wagering standpoint, he did not get any attention whatsoever. So However, no money down on this horse. Nobody's nobody's wagering on it. I mean, 80 no. to one shot. Who would ever put money on that? Exactly. So right. I didn't. Um, the woman behind me did. All right, she, she's married to a guy named Rich. Or- <laughs> She I put mean, she put ten bucks down. So <laughs> I know, right? Good for her. So so here this course comes out of nowhere. I mean, did you have to when you, when the twenty to when twenty came around the the track across the finish line? Did you have to go like who the hell is that? Well, no, because as soon as I saw the twenty one, I knew who it was, and I, I was standing in the tunnel right that leads out to the racetrack next to a, a assistant trainer named Jerry Dixon. Now Jerry 
he goes he, he was a little flabbergasted his son is the groom for rich strike oh so cut i it saw out. jerry and and he he had a stunned look on his face and then all of a sudden he realized that i happened to be standing right next to him and you know we did a high 10 we, we were we didn't do the high five we did a high 10. <laughs> you felt you went all in <laughs> yeah exactly uh you know jerry's one of these guys that you see at the racetrack every day and his his son works day in day out with rich strike so it was really kind of actually a cool spot to be with the proudest dad oh my on racetrack for gosh him. i can't imagine right you're sitting next to this person who probably felt like oh please just let the horse finish the race and he's first to cross the line he must have gone bananas he went he i mean tears and it, tears flowed pretty quickly oh, yeah. after. and then you know i walked out to the racetrack as they were coming back and and you know see all the connections and they they were as, as stunned as the crowd i don't think they expect they they love to hit the board they love to run into the top three but the race set up absolutely perfectly for red strike a really quick pace out front He's a, just a stone cold closer. Yeah, the, clearly. I mean, the cool, yeah, literally. The co coolest thing that you can see and watch now is the drone overhead video of the race. And you watch the trip that they, that they took to get to the finish line. I mean, it was dodging and weaving, but they didn't get into any trouble throughout the whole course of the race. It was spread out just enough to allow them to take the short route home and, and, and be, you know, the favorites, the, the top two favorites ran second and third. The drone footage, and if and if anybody's listening to this, and you can pause it here and go watch the drone footage of the race, because it is, it is bonkers. You'll watch it two or three times to watch the line that this horse takes to accelerate through to the finish line. It's very, very cool. But it's also kind of cool. I mean, you've seen a million horse races, and it's kind of cool to know that, like, even in this moment, you can still be next to the person and, you know, the, the emotion still comes out. It's not just so analytical. Okay. Well, the horse has made it around safe. Clearly that's the number one part of your job, but there's still that ability to connect with the excitement of the sport and see the real human and equine aspects of what goes on there. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, watching them come back and, and how excited the horse was, he, he knew he was, he knew he was a winner. I mean, he really knew. They can tell they know that's what they do and and you know I love horse racing for one of the greatest things about it is it's a great equalizer because a lot of times you've got you know a billionaire owner with a trainer who might be a millionaire with a jockey who might be you know right there with the trainer potentially half a million dollars a year with a groom who a lot of times is the the bread and butter of this thing, keeping the glue, to, keeping the whole stable together, who sometimes is an immigrant, sometimes is, a, is, you know, somebody who just loves to be with the horses and they're all together hmm. in the winter circle, laughing, smiling, because, you know, winning a horse race is what it's all about from the Kentucky Derby down to, you know, maiden claiming race on a Wednesday afternoon. Can you talk a little bit about the short term effect for the racetrack on such a such a such a wild win, right? This is something that like entered the zeitgeist, right? It was what everybody was talking about. People who, you know, people I mean, this is the interesting thing about the Kentucky Derby, right? Because people who don't think about horse racing at any other time in the year become so excited by this event. So I'm wondering what like from your perspective, what short term effects are. And then let's talk about well, after that, like what are the longer term hopes for for impact? So let's talk about short term first. Like what what's the hopes? So, I mean, we've already exceeded our expectations from the standpoint of this race getting getting out there into yeah. the public eye. Yep. Just the number of views on the overhead view alone on NBC Sports, oh, I think it's probably over 40 million at this point in time. Wow. And that's, that's solid. That's solid people watching a replay on on you know a traditional media's website. That's, that's awesome in and of itself. Right. Uh, but I've I've seen you know people taking this horse race and already creating that teach your kids this lesson. This is a horse that was claimed for thirty thousand dollars. Now, for those of you that don't know what that means, is that the original owners of this horse didn't have much you know any high expectations for him, so they entered him into a race where he was for sale. That doesn't happen with Kentucky Derby participants very frequently. I was going to say. I can think of like one or two other times where a horse was entered for sale but didn't get bought. 
because he ends up winning a bunch of races like charismatic comes to mind in yeah. 99 he was in for a claiming tag but didn't get claimed so they felt that they lucked out so this horse was actually claimed for thirty thousand dollars <laughs> then won his next start but then hasn't won since so he's on an over streak then you know ran third in the prep race up yeah. at yeah, the la- drew in at the last minute it's just like don't give up on your dreams and right. i've seen that this is a such a fantastic fantastic lesson for parents to teach their kids for coaches to teach their athletes for you know students to learn like don't give up the, yeah the, the, the keep your eye on the prize and keep going and keep trying and even when it doesn't feel like you've got a shot the pathway might open up for you and you Get you know derby glory literally in the last 20 seconds you, you yeah. just, the opportunity has to present itself and all and then things like that so short term i'm humble yeah right so plenty of attention for the race a little bit of more enthusiasm about horse racing do you see any long-term impact coming out of this is this something that you feel like will generate more excitement about race because i know one of the downsides of this and maybe we can talk about this a little bit is that rich strike i guess is not running and not will not be competing in the for the triple crown but let's talk about what the long-term hopes or expectations from your role as gm well first of all i i'm thrilled that we're talking about horse racing right now for the right sure. reasons. yeah it's coming out of last yeah. year's year. we're talking about it for the for the wrong reasons and so you know that maybe hopefully the public has a short memory and right. So you're talking about you're talking about Bob Baffert and, and some of the about, yeah some know, of the issues that a, went over a last positive year. test coming out of the Derby last year was talking about the Derby for the wrong reasons right but now people are talking about the Derby for the right reasons it, if there's an uplift in uh, attendance wagering and you know partnership opportunities because of this great you know it's a, such a fantastic story I feel like that will happen it's too soon to tell obviously but I feel like that that kind of thing will happen yeah can you Let's talk a little bit about, you know, your progression in horse race because you and I have actually known each other for a long time. Um, you're, yes. you, you're not a lo- you're not a horse guy. Like you did not grow up in the saddle riding around in the in the in the mean streets of uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about how did you get started and like what what continues to draw you to the to the sport? Sure. So um, we were we worked together back in the what 1994 1995 era um yeah you're the reason i have all this gray hair and you're the reason i have no hair (laughs) so (laughs) but uh some of the people who are are listening to this podcast might remember a woman named sharon kelly now sharon uh back when i got out of college i interned for the oakland a's right i need to and um, Sharon was the director of marketing for the A's. Right. Then. Yeah. And the baseball strike happened in 94. And that's when you and I ended up working together with Fred and Joanne Green. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, uh, Sharon had left um, the Oakland A's and had gone to be the director of marketing at Bay Meadows back in the day. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bay Meadows track on the peninsula in San Francisco. Yeah, in San Mateo. And um, after I left the Greens, really because I wanted to take a European vacation was why I left. And that's what you do when you're in your early twenties. Exactly. Uh, when you're flush with money, when that, <laughs> you yeah, take that European. Right. <laughs> uh, I came back from that trip with, and I was unemployed and yeah. I reached out to Sharon, who was at the track and it was Labor Day weekend, 1995. And I, I vividly remember calling her and saying, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking for something. And she said, um, you know, I don't have anything full time, but I could use your help this weekend. And so I, I visited with her on the Thursday of Labor Day. She um, actually put me to work on the Friday. I worked Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And sometime over the course of that weekend, she introduced me to the track president, a guy named Jack Lebow, who is still in the horse racing industry today is now helping run Los Alamitos down in Orange County. But he and I sat down in his office and just clicked. Huh. Um, for no good reason, other than the fact that maybe his farm manager at the time went to Cal Poly and I went to Cal Poly. We just had a great conversation and he said, you know, I think I want to hire you. I don't know what the job is, but I want to hire you. And I didn't know a single thing about horse racing at the time. I had maybe visited Bay Meadows one time during college and I didn't know what my job was going to be. He didn't know what my job was going to be. He just took a chance, hired a young kid who, you know, was good looking, funny, smart, all those things. And who, was, who was that? 
I, it was me back then, but a lot of shame. <laughs> for him. He, um, you know, he, he rolled the dice a little bit and, and, but then really quickly thereafter, the racetrack took to me and, mm. you know, I, it, it went from a job to plug a gap because I was unemployed to a career where I, I just fell in love with the sport. I could not get to the office early enough in the morning. I couldn't, nothing could keep me from it. And I just, I ate it up. It was such a great family atmosphere at the racetrack. And anybody who, who's worked at the racetrack knows that it is family. The yeah. vast majority of people are related. Yeah. So, you know, everybody knows everybody. And, you know, they welcomed me as an outsider because I put in the time and put in the hours and loved, they could tell that I loved it. And, you know, quickly thereafter, um, we were purchased by a company that was expanding nationally. So they took over. Is that, is that Magna? At the time, yeah, Magna, it was Magna. which yeah. had evolved into the Stronic Group, which is still owns, you know, Santa Anita Golden Gate Field. Okay. Um, so our, our management team from Bay Meadows began operating Bay Meadows and Golden Gate. And then about six months after that began managing Bay Meadows, Golden Gate and Santa Anita. And so I had the opportunity in the late 90s to move to Southern California and help operate Santa Anita for a number of years. Um, and then a couple of changes in, in management there led us back to Bay Meadows under a new ownership group. So we, same management team that was at Santa Anita yeah. went back to Bay Meadows in around 2003, we took over uh, running just that, that operation. And that only lasted about a year before the partner or the, uh, the principals at Bay Meadows bought Hollywood Park. Okay, I moved, I moved back to Southern California to help operate Hollywood Park, all under Jack Lebow, by the way. All all this, all this stems from you know Sharon Kelly Kelly dragging me into Bay Meadows for a Labor Day weekend, introducing me to Jack Lebow, and then so you know the lesson learned there is you never know when you're going to find someone who's going to uh, oh. get into the bank and open your opportunities for. I you. mean, it's such a great. I mean, for anybody who's thinking about. Oh gosh, I want a job in sports or, or anybody who wants a job anywhere for that matter. You know, that opportunity, I mean, how easy would it have been for you to just say, Hey, you know, Sharon, sorry, I'm looking for something full time. I'm, I'm not going to come in on the Thursday of a Labor Day weekend. That's, you know, just, I'm not, I'm not up for that boy. When, when an opportunity presents itself to you, you never know what's going to come out of it. You know, you just go jump in. It may not be the thing you want or the place you thought you wanted to go. I mean, that's, that's the, clearest lesson associated with strike the opportunity we talk about rich strike right not, exactly. to, not to come full circle look at that look at me making the making the analogies with rich strike but the yeah. other one of that too is what people pick up on passion right? right you're an outsider not necessarily a horse guy but you clearly fell in love with it and, and people glom onto that they read that and that's what brings you into the fold yes there's a punchline too by the way to the leave out story of course <laughs> 27 years later and he was here at Derby this year. So, was he really? Yeah. So I, you know, <laughs> I knew he was going to be here. It's really hard to see everybody. And I was walking down the hallway and ran head on into him. Like, Hey, Lebo, what are you doing here? It was, well, I knew he was going to be here, but it's just fantastic <laughs> that I still talk to him very frequently. You know, he knows he helped get me where I am today. I, I actually um, sent him a text that right before the Derby in, in, uh, 2020 and I because it was 25 years and I said you know 25 years ago you took a chance on a young kid who didn't know anything about horse racing here I am at the precipice of the sport just you know not that it was going to run without with me or without me but you know this this man took a chance on me that long ago and here I am working at Churchill Downs which run, helping run the Kentucky Derby is really to me the peak of the industry I like to also think that working with me was so terrible that's what caused you to take the european vacation that led you to go back to sharon so really yes. the foundation is here it is you you're right you're, you're welcome let's <laughs> <laughs> let me look i did have a chance to watch you during oaks day obviously you know you're, you're too crazy for you to to you know be available during during derby but i saw you on oaks day and um you know it's it's a little like being the mayor of a city. I mean, watching you, everybody going by you, 
has like a, Hey, can you, you know, Hey, can I, you know, can meet this guy? Can I grab you for a second? Can you talk what's, what that's like? I mean, is what's, that- what's interesting is what you're specifically asking about was the mayor of Louisville. That <laughs> it was the mayor, wasn't it? <laughs> he asked, he asked me while we were speaking to, to come say hi to some of his guests. So yeah. the literal mayor asked me to come meet some, um, he was on your city that day though. He was, and <laughs> he, he's actually this, he's in the, in the tail end of his last term. So he, he, uh, spent a lot of time with us over Derby Week. And it's awesome that people come out to to experience it. It's such a big part of the city and the state. To answer your question, it's a, as big as the Derby is, it's still a small, it's still a small event. Everybody who participates in the sport knows everybody else. So oh, yeah, sure. I, I'm running into people from, you know, California, Louisiana, Florida, who all participate. And then everybody in the city comes out. It's just, it's just, it's such a great event. And in spite of the fact that there's 150,000 people here, you're still like like running into Lebow in the middle of the hallway in under the grandstand. It's just I can't walk through here without seeing somebody I know from some point in my career. When you, he, you brought it up a little while ago, right? I mean, there is a certain family aspect of the whole thing. It's not just the families that are operating, like the families that run the horses and things like that. But I mean, it is such a small group of people who are actively involved with putting on these races. So it is sort of reunion week, I imagine, for when Derby comes around. It's such a landscape, like it's such a key event every it year is. on the calendar. Reunion week is a great way to put it because, yeah. you know, a lot of people in the industry, in the business come out for Derby and get a chance to try to get a chance to catch up. Some of the coolest stuff that happens Derby week is in the backside in the morning when the horses go on the track. And, you know, a lot of people from throughout the industry, throughout the country come out for that week and get a look. Get a look, but also it's a it's it's just social and it's a yeah. ton of fun. Yeah. Is that like is that open to the general public? Is that uh is that an event that should not be missed if somebody goes to Derby Week? So actually, um the the barn area is not open to the general public, but the front side is. So we open up the grandstand of the racetrack uh for I think eleven days leading up to Derby mm. for the public to park in the parking lot, walk through the gates and go watch the horses train. They are on the racetrack every morning from the, the Derby and Oaks horses are on the racetrack every morning from 7:30 to 7:45. They have specific saddle towels so you can identify who it is. Okay. It's it's uh the public in in and around Louisville has really embraced the ability to come out and see these horses because you know it's 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 such a part of it that they don't generally get a chance to see. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit? Let's let's go back up to 35,000 feet. All right. About where horse racing is headed. Right. Like you said, I think it, the one of the things you said earlier was like, it's nice to be talking about horse racing in a, in a positive t- way again. And the Derby is a is a huge attention grabbing event and the Preakness and the Belmont to a somewhat lesser extent. Um, but beyond those, horse racing kind of fades a little bit. I mean, what when you as you, in your seat as general manager, what what does the sport need to do in general to, to sort of take advantage of those moments? Churchill down specifically, like what's the, is there an overarching strategy? Is there, where's, where's the sport headed to, to, to continue to grow it? Well, so interestingly, um, it's, it's Sunday morning and the week after Derby, we picked up racing again on Thursday. We had 7,500 people here Thursday afternoon for our twilight racing program. Mm-hmm. Friday, I think we had just short of 7,000. And we raced last night and and had close to 15,000 people here. So oh. it's not it, it it's not in the in the greater public's eye, but it sure still is an event here yeah. every week. You know, so so unique to sport, Kentucky Derby is our opening week. Mm-hmm. Most most sports run their championships at the end of the year. <laughs> but we <laughs> open up and then we go right into a seven week racing season. And around Louisville, we we do what I think our our marketing and partnership team does a great job, and sales team does a great job putting people in their seats throughout the course of the year. We run we run about seventy five race days over the calendar year, and it's it's still a solid event here in Louisville. It of course um, horse racing used to be the only game in town from a gambling perspective for for generations. Yeah. And, you know, lotteries and sports came into play and then ca- 
casinos outside of Vegas and uh, Atlantic City. So the gambling dollar is being competed for, but that just forces us to offer more compelling programming. And honestly, who doesn't love watching the, honestly, the, the thrill and excitement of horse racing? These, these animals love to run. Yeah. They are competitive. People ask me all the time, do, do they like to do what they're doing? And I always point back to, you ever see what happens in a horse race when the jockey falls off at the gate? <laughs> horse the, keeps going. <laughs> the horse still fights to win the race. Yeah. Because that's their instinct to be the fastest animal. That's what thoroughbreds do. It's a ton of fun to watch. Yeah. Oh, on a national scale, yeah, we, we missed a generation probably, but I think that things like a rich strike and the social media surrounding it, I think that will really help with, with the current next generation. That kind of thing, those sort of, again, those sort of zeitgeist moments where it enters the public consciousness and maybe makes someone think, oh my gosh, what an amazing thing. I'd like to be a part of that. Yeah, and plus you see the pageantry of it all. And that, obviously the Derby is a great bucket list item for, for a lot of people, but uh, it's, a, it's an attainable. Like you can come to the Derby on any budget. You can yeah. come out here for, for you know, $65 and enjoy the infield, which is pretty enjoyable. <laughs> if, uh, you know, it's got a lot of fun stuff going on out there. Yeah. And all the way up to the, to the top of the track in what we call a mansion, which is one of the most exclusive and best experiences for customers. For I will be looking forward to that in 2023. Um, I would bring it up to the mansion. <laughs> it, so you brought up gambling a second ago and the competition for for gambling dollars and obviously Supreme Court struck down the the state the federal ban on on sports wagering has that impacted horse racing in a way that you've seen so far do you have is there things the strategies that you're all thinking about hey we want to try to grab more of those wagering dollars because clearly that's the bedrock of the financial well-being of of, of Churchill Downs and, and the sport in general yeah so um it's too soon to say, to say whether the sport's been impacted, but um, wagering's up the last two to three years. So, you know, maybe the, you know, the rising tides lift all boats concept comes into play here because pe more people are paying attention to, to gambling and there's always a horse race going on. Yeah. You know, sports are on a schedule, but, um, you can open up an account with twinspires.com, which I believe you did. <laughs> and you can- what? Are, you, are you checking on my gambling? Oh, I think we talked about it. But uh, <laughs> almost almost every half hour, 24 seven, there's a horse race somewhere in the world that you can find action on. Um, right. Some of it's more compelling than others, but uh, it's, it's a sport that I think it's also really, it's the product is compelling and you can, What's cool about betting on horse racing is it's it's pair mutual wagering. So what that means is your the the house takes a fixed amount off the top, mm -hmm. and then the other percentage goes back to the betting public. So you're not playing against the house, you're playing against each other. So there's a ton of data available. There's so many data points. Like if available. you want to dive in, yeah, yeah, and so. It, it becomes like a puzzle to, to solve. And a lot of people with data-driven technical minds look at the data and say, I, I think I can figure this puzzle out. Yeah. And, and so that to me is, is what's fun about betting on horse racing. Like, and when, when I get new people out of the track, I always show them all the opportunity to compare data among each horse just in our program. It's got past performances, it's got breeding, it's got age speed where it's run before those types of things you can look at so many different data points and i said just focus on three or four of them and look at the last race and then see what stands out from the horse that won in the last race and then go to the next race and try to pick up on those data points and see if they come into play and you know it's a, it's a quick lesson but we we get a lot of people really excited to come back because all they have to do is cash that first ticket. <laughs> That's right, exactly. You didn't really think people who were listening to this did not know that they were going to be getting the secrets to paramutual wagering associated yeah. with right from the general manager of Churchill Downs, Mike Ziegler. Thank you very much, Mike. But before I let you go, um, I like to do the lightning round. 
Now I've the okay. Shoot the, the lightning round. These are you know, these are questions that Mike has not seen, and so what I'd like you to do, Mike, just give me quick responses to the following questions. Are you ready? Are you ready for okay. the lightning round? Let's do this okay. thing. Okay. What's your favorite bourbon other than Woodsford Reserve, which is obviously the title sponsor of the Kentucky Derby? Of course, Old Forester. Old Forester. There we go. What cannot be missed on Derby Day? What's the thing that everybody has to do? Oh, you gotta, you gotta see my old Kentucky home. See people, see the singing of my own Kentucky home. Yeah. All right. All right. Other than the Derby, what's the best event at Churchill Downs to go see? Uh, best racing is on Stephen Foster Day, which is at the end of our spring meet. It's uh, six stakes races across the board, different categories. Sometimes a champion, older horse comes out of the Stephen Foster handicap. All right. Very good. Yeah, you are a Bay Area native. Uh, what do you miss the most about California? I had an avocado tree in my backyard in, in, uh, when I lived in Southern California. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I miss the hardest thing for me about living in Kentucky, which is on the Eastern time zone, is uh, A's and Warriors scores. I have to oh, yeah. To get those scores. Yep. You're not staying up for those games. I'm not staying up for those. Games. <laughs> All right. Finish this sentence. The biggest misconception about horse racing is that the horses are mistreated okay very good on a scale of one to ten with ten being awesome one being terrible how was my oaks outfit your oaks outfit was seven it was seven, <sighs> seven to eight all right it was it was pretty good it was pretty good <laughs> okay you were, right. you were wearing a hat yeah no hats i'm not a hat guy all right. All right. Well, these are all part of my learning I mean, for, for me, but it might have worked on you. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Ziegler, general manager of Churchill Downs. Thanks for joining us. Mike, I look forward to talking to you. It was great to see you at the, at the races. Always, Dave. Great, great to see you, too. Thanks for listening to this ADC Partners podcast. For more information about ADC Partners, please visit our website at ADCPartners.com.